Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the second uh, Singapore Symp Symposium Legal Theory Session uh, for 2015. Um, thank you for coming. And thank you in particular uh, for coming to our uh, guest, uh, Professor Martin Krieger, who is a chaired professor at the University of New South Wales. Um, he's the author and editor of numerous books, uh, including a number of books on the rule of law and uh, social values. Uh, he works in this area both as a public intellectual and as a very serious academic. Uh, he is a former presenter of the uh, Boyer Lectures, which uh, is uh, run by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, or at least was set up by them, uh, and that numbers him amongst the, the great and good, I think, of Australian public intellectuals. Uh, but more importantly than that, for our purposes, he's uh, a very well-known uh, academic, uh, a very serious one, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm still recovering from breakfast with Andrew, both from the, from the length of the walk and the power of the Indian breakfast that is still reminding me of its presence. Uh, but I am, I am very pleased to, to be here, and I'm talking, as you know, on uh, the rule of law and neoliberalism, which is an accidental combination for me, though not for the world, uh, for me, it's accidental because neoliberalism has not been my subject, and I'm a little suspicious of the kind of loading on to some little category of all the ills, because neoliberalism is not these days, though it was once a term of praise most times. Nevertheless, I was asked to do it, and in doing it, found that there were things that I thought I could say, and there were certain... Um, repeated tendencies, some of them I think to be errors, which go with a certain way, a certain disposition, which I think is the word that I was using in the paper, which is or is about neoliberal. I won't do too much to define that, that term, but I'll talk about the disposition. The paper, um, I understand it's been distributed, but I don't know that I should presume anyone's read it. it the, the paper starts with the observation which everybody, everybody who now writes about the rule of law starts with, that, well, everybody's using the word, everybody says they're for it, and uh, no one knows what it means. This is, there are a series of cliches, and these are among the cliches, that begin every paper, including every paper of my own, about the rule of law, but nobody seems to, to take any uh, heed, and they just go on writing about the rule of law. But it's a different story because from when people used to write. In my, when I was a, a younger academic and started to be interested in the rule of law, because I was interested in a hostile way in despotism, uh, rule of law was not of many interest, of much interest to many people, except maybe people who give law after dinner speeches. Uh, there was very little said, and after Lon Fuller's list of eight characteristics. There was very little controversy about the detail, the, the, the anatomy of the rule of law. To the extent there was controversy, and there was some, it was about evaluation of the rule of law. Many academics, particularly Marxists, thought it, thought it as, as bourgeois ideology and uh, simply masking uh, power of ruling classes. And I didn't like that talk, I didn't believe that. And so at that time, I started writing about the rule of law without a thought about what it might be. It seemed to me that that was completely unproblematic. I just was for it. And uh, what has struck me uh, now is that, or in, in recent years, is that nobody really is against it or says publicly they're against it. And anyway, the, the extraordinary take up of this notion, or at least of this phrase, by international agencies is, if not unprecedented, certainly remarkable. Uh, and that's over at least the last 25 years. And I put that number on it because I think it has a lot to do with the collapse of communism. But even then, in the first few years, particularly after that collapse, 
the rule of law was seen as a primarily political legal notion. The rule of law was something uh, that despots did without. To their and their, their uh, citizens' misfortune, so the line might go. My line did go. Uh, and then, like some footballer who gets you by surprise, economists came in and whoops, this same phrase has taken over an enor has, has had an enormous career which bears little substantive relationship to its earlier, to its genesis. And in particular to the, genesis, to the disposition of thought that I'm going to start with in this paper, uh, where I move from, I start by just outlining this, what I call disposition. I don't want to do anything more fancy with it. It's, uh, disposition is enough. People, there are a lot of people who think that there's something wrong with arbitrary power. And that's all really I'll start with. And then I want to take it through three iterations. Uh, one, how that got connected with law. When I say how it got connected, I'm not talking as a historian. I try to draw on my readings of the past. If I get them wrong, I apologize in advance. My claims are not historical, but they're normative. But uh, there have been a lot of smart people who have been interested in the rule of law and a lot of predicaments which have shown that something connected with this disposition might have something to be said for it. So I start with, with law. Then I uh, say something about what I imagine to be connections between liberalism and this notion. And then I move on to uh, talk a little about how the disposition I begin with fares under neoliberal uh, treatments. And in each of these stages, I'll try to outline a little what I have in mind and then suggest some implications which seem to me to flow at that stage from what I've said. Implications from taking this disposition seriously, implications from thinking of law as having some connection with it, implications from being interested in it for neoliberal reasons. So that's the sort of plan of action, and if I remember it, that's the way we'll go. Start with the disposition. It's not news uh, that many people for many millennia, uh, in many legal political traditions, have thought that there is something that stinks about arbitrary power, about that combination, arbitrary power. Uh, in, in a, a sort of companion piece that I wrote at the same time for another purpose, which is called Tempering Power, uh, I try to say more than I do in this paper about why I think arbitrary power is so obnoxious. And I stress it because, in a sense, who's for arbitrary power? Uh, nobody says they're for arbitrary power, but I want to emphasize, oh, well, deans are probably, they, they have a special sort of professional deformation in this in this regard, but those of us ordinary people who simply receive orders very often don't like them to have come in an arbitrary way. So why do I make such a meal of it? I want to say a couple of things about it. First, the com this is one of these implications. Arbitrariness in of itself is not such a t terrible thing. Um, children are arbitrary sometimes until they get a bit older. It seems it's charming. Poets can be arbitrary. Uh, the thing that is obnoxious is the combination of arbitrariness with power. And obnoxious for at least four reasons which I've sought to go into elsewhere, not in this talk. One is, I could expand on them uh, if you want, but I won't now, uh, the, that arbitrary power is maybe not an inevitable, but a very, very common source of fear. This was why Judith Schlar is one of the more articulate defenders of what she calls the liberalism of fear. Fear is reasonable fear, or fear generated by people and by institutions is something that, if you think politically, you have very good reason to try to avoid and try to, uh, well, try to avoid. Secondly, and connected with that and elaborated in a very specific way, but not in an idiosyncratic way by Philip Pettit, is that arbitrary power is, uh, contradicts 
the possibility of freedom. That's, I think, as strongly as he would put it. In any event, in a less strong version, you can just say arbitrary power is hostile to freedom. Third, and this is a point that Lon Fuller has made and Jeremy Waldron has made, arbitrary power, uh, the exercise, the arbitrary exercise of power is flouts uh, the dignity of the object of the power. If you don't know where it's coming from, you've got no control over it, you can't have a voice in the exercise of power as it relates to you, then you're treated as an object or as Waldron has put it in several papers, you're treated like a dilapidated house or a rabid dog. There's something different between being treated as a person rather than a dilapidated house or a rabid dog. I keep getting these mixed up, so I have people, people should not be tr treated as dilapidated dogs or rabid houses, but in any event, the point is dignity at that one. And finally, an economist's point, uh, arbitrary power makes coordination among citizens and between citizens and institutions systematically difficult, messes it up. That's the reason to, dis to, to say something against it, I think. Uh, one other point I'd like to make, which I don't, again, make in this paper, I'm sorry I keep telling you things from, that I haven't said in the paper, but because Andrew and Nicole uh, collared me to do another paper for Thursday, it's easy for me to confuse them. And in that, I want to say, it, it's not just that I think arbitrary power is a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing in and of itself, independent, separate from the content or the end for which the power is exercised. In other words, many people uh, criticized Lon Fuller for saying that his recipe, or what is caricatured as his list of uh, conditions of legality, the internal morality of law, that it was not really a morality. That's a standard criticism. But no one criticizes the details. Uh, when they criticize it as saying it's not a morality, they typically say, look, you can do terrible things uh, in a non-arbitrary manner. And there are many possible worlds in which you can and some in which you do, but two points. One, arbitrary power, non-arbitrary, systematically or routinely highly well institutionalized non-arbitrary power is hard to put to the worst of purposes. I put this exactly the opposite of what I meant to say, but powerful people like to do things, if they're horrible things, in the dark. It doesn't take too much. Uh, working out why that should be do so. So that's one sort of empirical hunch that Fuller had and that I had. But more deeply than that, I want to say it's bad in itself, independent of whether it, there is that link. So I'm focusing on the arbitrariness of power rather than the goodness and badness in terms of some substantive uh, uh, analysis of the of the content of the laws. It's the way power is exercised, the rule of law, I want to suggest, a lot hangs on this for me, but it doesn't have to for you. In other words, if you think that's rubbish, uh, then bear with me, because the rubbish doesn't hold up the whole structure. Even if you think the rule of law is not what I say it is, still some of what I say further uh, might or might not go through independent of that. But I do say, that, or I do want to say that it, for the concept to do real and good work, if it is to do that, it's got to be distinguished from everything else we like, or anything else we like, and, and I think that the distinction uh, sensibly can be made by saying that the rule of law has in particular to do with the ways power is exercised as distinct from the content of the goals of the exercise of power. So I just start with that disposition. Uh, that is not mine, and for this to be of any interest, it cannot be just mine. It, I'm saying there are a lot of people who've thought arbitrary power is obnoxious, and I'm with them. Okay, you could think that, and this is the second stage of what I want to say about um, this disposition and law, you can think that without thinking that there is any special connection between hostility to arbitrary power, a wish to uh, think of ways to 
temper arbitrary power. Uh, and law. You could just think, well, that's, we should temper arbitrary power, but law is a lousy instrument for that. Either because, as Marxists have thought, the law is not in the interests of everyone, it's the interests of some, systematically, and that's the way it's going to be. Others, because uh, they believe law is too weak a read to sustain uh, constraint or tempering of arbitrary power. Others, and I've become one of those, because they think it all depends how well law itself as an institution might do this goal, serve this value. It's a matter to be assessed in particular circumstances. You can't assume, and I do believe this, that law is the preeminent vehicle for delivering the value of the rule of law, that is anti-arbitrariness. Whether it does so or not depends on circumstances. One, I'm sorry, I have to go back one step. Uh, in the paper, I talk, the phrase I use for the value that I value as distinct from the one, the disvalue of arbitrary power, is tempering power. When I came to that word tempering, I was terribly pleased thinking it was my original input until I checked um, Bracton, who wrote in the 13th century, and he already uses the phrase, which means I'm a little late, but uh, I want to use it because the general language of uh, discussion of the rule of law as of constitutionalism typically is a language of limits, constraints, a negative language. Raz says that the rule of law is only a negative virtue. All it does is prevent what would be available to law if you didn't constrain it by the rule of law. For a range of reasons, I think that that is, while it has a seed that is important, that is constraint is important, uh, it's, a, it's a deep mistake to think of uh, hostility to arbitrary power as having to be manifest in a hostile, constraining, manacling, uh, corralling, lassoing attitude to power. Power is often something we have need of, and anyway, we can't get rid of it. Uh, and I want to suggest that tempering power, the tempering, which is really just a metaphor, but if you think of we temper justice with mercy, which is an, it, 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 it suggests balance. We temper steel. It suggests that sometimes it's not weakness what you want, but a certain sort of purpose, for the purpose effective strength that you want. Anyway, I just throw that in. Uh, that seems to me tempering is a more, it's only a metaphor, but it's a more, it, it puts you on the right track more than the typical adjectives we use. Anyway, if you're for tempering, or if you're for constraint, limitation, whatever, why law? I think there are questions, many more questions than lawyers typically ask, about why, if you're committed to the rule of law, you should think law should be the preeminent vehicle to deliver it. But I don't think it's especially surprising that people have latched on to law who have been concerned with tempering power. Uh, Lawyers are in the business of dealing with the exercise of power. That's what they do. They're not in the business, the big business, of delivering, of thinking deeply about social justice. Often they're in much smaller businesses than that. And so when I came across, I think, very interesting work, much of it comparative and some of it historical, by Terry Halliday of uh, Northwestern University, American Bar Foundation, a number of collaborators who have done work all over the world uh, trying to uh, plot the relationships among lawyers or between lawyers and various revolutionary movements, they find that what they call the legal complex, not just lawyers but judges and people involved in the legal apparatus, they say consistently and persistently uh, upholds or seeks to uphold a significant but constrained set of values. Significant because they include civil liberties, they include something to do with a, a, a moderation of state power, 
but they, they, it's constrained in that they don't talk about more ample, if you like, or more ambitious uh, conceptions. That's not their bag. And I think that's not a surprise. I mean, that lawyers should be, on the one hand, interested in constraining, institutionalising, making predictable, making as ascertainable uh, the ways that power is exercised, while they're not in the social transformation business, they're not in the huge uh, justice business. And certainly, lawyers have been very prominent in speaking about the rule of law and in uh, articulating reasons for hostility to, um, to arbitrary power. And, and political theorists, many of them, Montesquieu perhaps most interestingly, have thought that law was a central path of distinction between uh, arbitrary power and its uh, less obnoxious uses, and Aristotle even earlier than that uh, in his distinction between the uh, power of lords and the, and the power of men. Don't think these are accidental. I think that these are, it, it's therefore not a surprise that many legal traditions have sought to elaborate some notion of ways in which the law might properly be a temper, might temper power. One of these, recently, an Italian legal theorist, Gianluigi Palombella, uh, goes back to medieval English law and a distinction that he, he gets from the 1930s writer on constitutionalism, Charles McElwain, between uh, the sphere of power, which is the king's and the king's alone, and within which the king is supreme, that is the gubernaculum, looking govern, governance, and that sphere which nonetheless, even the king is barred by law from invading, and which was called jurisdictio. And Palombella seeks to draw from this distinction something which is not institutionally uh, tied, doesn't have to be institutionally tied to whatever institutions were thought to be doing it in the, in the media, Middle Ages, but seeks to generalize this notion that for the rule of law to, to be real, you need to have within law itself some such balance between the power of the, the real power of a sovereign and uh, the rights set by law, which not even a sovereign power can invade. This, Palombella says, is a very distinctive feature of the English rule of law tradition, which distinguishes it from, for example, the Rechtsstaats tradition in Germany, which was then copied in many countries in the world, where the Rechtsstaat was a state in which operating in certain ways was a way in which you identified whether law was operating or not. It was not that there was any superior there was no superior in law to the state, but for the state to operate by law, it had to operate in certain ways. Palombella says, until the 20th century, when the continental jurisdictions added the notion of a constitution, a binding constitution, the Rechtsstaat was, he believes, defective in this regard. I simply follow him ignorantly in this. He may be wrong, but, and I think, uh, uh, for other reasons, there are limitations to his account. But I think that the account that there one seeks to have, not an emasculation of power, but a kind of moderation, which was uh, Montesquieu's term, uh, limitation, often through mechanisms of balancing within the legal order, is fertile. Now, Two implications of some relevance to uh, neoliberal accounts, to which I'll be coming um, shortly, might flow from this rendition, this uh, quasi-historical rendition of what might have been the past. Um, one is that this balance, the notion of balance, captures something which is sometimes 
sold short in neoliberal and many other accounts, negative accounts of constitutionalism, where the const const constitutionalism, the rule of law, are seen as barriers to some predator. Hayek says, power is the arch evil, and power he only associates with the state, and so the rule of law is what you need as, as barriers to this. Uh, that's a common way of talking. It's part of the negative conception of the rule of law, which, which seems to me too limiting. And the attraction to me of Palombella, even if he's wrong historically, is that he captures that for the disposition with which I started, that is hostility to arbitrary exercise of power, uh, of publicly significant power, that is, that makes a difference to subjects, uh, it's not a one way, it, 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 then it's not only one, um, let me scrap that sentence. Uh, for that disposition to be honored, nothing is said about whether power, state power is good or ill. It is simply that some balance, some constraint on arbitrariness needs to be built into, institutionalized into the system. That's one, uh, non-neo-liberal limitation I'd like to draw from that, that story. A second one, more general one, is that at least since Fuller, and in fact in the Rechstadt's tradition a lot earlier, the rule of law has been associated with a series of, in a sense, intuitively plausible institutional hypotheses. Well, if you want to know, you've got to know the law, so it should be public. Predict it should be not retrospective. You, so you get this list. The rule of law tradition in England goes from at least the Middle Ages, and it was not until about the 18th century where people started talking this language, and then they started in German. So the disposition that I'm talking about, the hostility to arbitrary power, did not find some specific institutional set of recommendations such as you might get from Dicey or you do get from Fuller or you get from acolytes all over the place including Raz, somehow people were found it available to talk about hostility to arbitrariness without thinking that there is some recipe list of the ingredients necessary for it, uh, which is what it is, that is, rule of law is this list. In other work, I distinguish between what I call teleological accounts of the rule of law, uh, and mine is a teleological account, that is, accounts which say the rule of law is for something. What is it for? It is for tempering power so that arbitrary exercise is rendered less possible. But the typical way in which legal theorists understand or at least talk about the rule of law is not teleological. They start with the anatomy of institutions. What's the rule of law? It is a legal system where the law is predictable, is this, that, that. Uh, Waldron says, well, it's not only that. We've got to add another list of characteristics, procedural characteristics, which mean that people are treated like a person in the court. It seems to me that these ways, this typical way of understanding law is first historically implausible, because people were talking this notion for a very long time before they had this bag of tricks that we've come up with in the 20th century. And secondly, to start with the box of tricks, particularly in a world such as the one in which we live, where the rule of law is being invoked from, for countries from all over the world with traditions of all sorts, to imagine that the rule of law is some, has already found its institutional embodiment, which the benighted countries to which the UN or the IMF or uh, the World Bank or the World Justice Project delivers its services, uh, it seems to me that we don't know that. That what gets you constraint, tempering of power, is a social experiment so far, particularly in the countries to which we seek to export it. It's developed in all sorts of ways in a number, a few countries which have long legal traditions, which are developed often haphazardly. But the notion that we have some recipe list of the institutional ingredients to get this uh, hallowed result seems to me overly ambitious and in all sorts of ways pathological in its consequences. So I don't like it. Uh, 
These are implications I draw from the legal story. Now, what about the liberal story? Liberalism, of course, is not like Marxism, uh, a, a tradition of thought with a canonical set of writers, though there are some people who are clearly close to the top. Uh, but what, there isn't a set of texts which call to be uh, called to be interpreted, which demand to be interpreted, uh, theological, as in theology or Marxism, a different sort of theology. But there have been strong liberal, and, and sorry, and to add to the confusion, American liberal, as we all know, is a very different animal from an English liberal. Uh, there are all sorts of confusion, but there are certain dispositions strong in this, to some extent, in co-ed tradition. And liberty, uh, uh, attachment to it is central among them, and therefore it's easy to find within liberal writings some of the most powerful and articulate uh, expressions of the disposition with which I start. Arbitrary power, liberals are hostile to it. Republicans are more than hostile. They think that liberals are too wishy-washy about, about uh, arbitrary power because if it's not being directed against you, you're still free according to the liberal, whereas according to somebody such as Philip Pettit, so long as there is anybody able to lord it over you, you are under their dom domination, even if they never exercise that power. In any event, in the liberal tradition, more so perhaps in the republican tradition, hostility to arbitrariness has been very uh, a central part of it. And uh, it carried on by neoliberals, though it seems to me in ways that deform it in, in, in some respects. One articulation one sort of articulation of this hostility to arbitrary power, which I found very powerful for a very long time, I still think it's powerful, I just think it needs supplementation, is the one by the Harvard political theorist uh, Judith Schklar, who called it the liberalism of fear. For her, there, were, there was a choice between two stark options, law and war, and she believed that this was Montesquieu's teaching that uh, whatever else you want out of uh, law, the first, and for her, in many respects, the only fundamental goal to be served is her term damage control. That's what the rule of law is about, damage control. And it seems to me that while I've now come to think there are limitations, and in this other piece on tempering power, I try to explore those limitations, uh, I still think that that's a fundamentally important place to start. Only people who live in Australia and other places which have never really experienced much at all can uh, be r relentlessly, not only people, in fact, people can be this anyway, relentlessly light-minded about what Schkla says is so important. Damage control is very, very big deal. But I think that thinking of the rule of law purely as a means of damage control is uh, misleading for, for several reasons. And one of them is that uh, something which has been developed partly again by where is Waldron's student, yes. <laughs> Partly by Waldron, but before him and more extensively by Steve Holmes. Steve Holmes, also from NYU, has for many years developed uh, a, an account of liberalism which puts central to it what he calls positive constitutionalism. Positive constitutionalism, which he derives from 17th century thinkers, from Baudin, from Hobbes, uh, discovers that constraints enable, that uh, constitutional and rule of law constraints on power are not simply and not rightly to be seen as manacles, as, as chains, as, as holding things back, but as fundamentally important enablers of the proper 
and strong exercise of power. In various writings, Holmes talks about, think of them not as, uh, as chains, but as uh, a vocabulary, as a language, as a script. He thinks of constitutions as scripts, according to which, by the exercise of disciplined power, uh, power holders, on the one hand, are constrained from arbitrary exercise of power, but not emasculated, on the contrary, made more effective in uh, the exercise of power for good purposes. There's a, uh, again, this is not in this play. Uh, there is a distinction that the historical sociologist uh, Michael Mann draws between two sorts of state, or two sorts of state power. One, two sorts of power. One he calls despotic and the other he calls infrastructural. Despotic power is the power simply to push your will through against any obstacles. Infrastructure is the, uh, as, it, as the name suggests, the power to uh, penetrate and enmesh the power within a society. And for reasons not too far to seek, despotic power is typically inconsistent with infrastructural power. When the Soviet Union collapsed like this, it was still potentially despotically very strong, but you couldn't, nobody who's driven on a Russian road will think that it was infrastructurally to, uh, very strong or gone to a Russian or a Polish medical service or tried to use a, a phone. Uh, and I think that the liberalism of fear trajectory slights and generates a false uh, hostility to the proper exercise of power, which an account which accommodates the positive uses of power doesn't. And it seems to me that there are a lot of there's a lot in the liberal tradition which allows for this, and that's one thing that I that I do want to draw from it. Secondly, uh, I mention an adaptation of the liberal tradition which says that even though he wasn't talking about Schkla, but you can adapt it. There is a kind of sem semantic priority that you need to give to damage control unless you can constrain the possibilities of arbitrary power, then a lot else can't be done. So in that sense, it's got a priority. Once that happens, don't pretend, as I confess I, I think neoliberals typically do pretend, that everywhere you go, every circumstance you face, this is your primary problem. Because in many well-ordered states, this problem has been solved. Uh, in a society where power is either omnipotent or, uh, or evanescent, or, 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 or it doesn't exist, that is, if the power is too powerful or not powerful enough, then damage control is a very, very pressing, a matter of very pressing urgency. In societies where there are strong legal traditions, strong uh, legal institutions, long familiarity with a whole range of notions of this sort, one isn't in that same position. Damage control is always important, but sometimes it's been done to a greater extent than in other places, and then you can get on with other things. So I don't want to, well, I do endorse, and I learned, and, uh, most from these traditions about what mattered to me in uh, politics in relation to power. Uh, they don't in any way uh, match the Hayekian hostility to state power, which is manifest in a great deal of uh, neoliberal doctrine and in, in Friedman and uh, maybe more extremely and in others. And one other implication, which is, again, it takes us back to the original statement of the disposition. If all we started with is that the arbitrary exercise of power is obnoxious, nothing was said then about it being state power. And so, unless one can say that there is some qualitative dif difference, which there might be, uh, between arbitrary power when exercised by a state, 
an arbitrary power when exercised by some large corporations or by banks or by uh, mafiosi or by al-Qaeda or by a whole range of non-state actors, members of what we used to call civil society, society uh, then the radical disjunction between state power, which needs to be manacled, and all that other stuff, which it doesn't appear to uh, require the same sort of treatment, seems to me fundamentally uh, deeply misplaced. There have been times, and it's still true, there have been times when state power was just bigger than anything else. Well, that's important to note. It is still true that states exercise forms of power which typically no one else has. That's also important to know. But we know that there are many, uh, and you don't have to be a Marxist to recognize this, that there are many forms of social power which are exercised directly by other entities. And to the extent that the originating, I mean, my, the, original, the disposition with which I started has anything going for it, it has to be telling us something about the uh, dangers of arbitrary exercise of non-state power. Which brings me now to neoliberalism. Uh, I'm sorry I was unleashed by Andrew because I've given this paper before in one version when I was given f uh, half an hour and another version I was given 15 minutes. And now when I, we were walking this morning I was told 50 minutes. I thought I could tell the history of the world in 50 minutes. So I'm, I'm sorry that I'm inflicting this on you but we're getting to the, the last stretch though it's half the paper I have to say. Uh, but I think I can say it a bit more swiftly. Now, I, I've already said that, I, that scapegoating neoliberalism uh, is cheap talk among, these days among non-neoliberals. And I don't want to, uh, I don't think it's plausible. I think that uh, the reasons that, for example, rule of law initiatives have some problems, uh, which I've been interested in in other observation, isn't all down to neoliberalism. It's down to many other things. Still, it seems to me that there is at least there are dispositions of thinking about politics and law which are common to a lot of people who have influence in the rule of law, in shaping the rule of law agenda these days, in major public institutions, uh, international institutions like the World Bank, of course, uh, the IMF and others, and which have transformed in powerful ways the agendas of, of modern states and not only modern ones. So as a shorthand, but not as an all-purpose um, scapegoat, uh, I'll talk about neoliberalism. Seems to me that uh, neoliberals talking about law have talked in two registers, one I call the wholesale, one retail. The wholesale register is the one more known popularly. Uh, reduced to a shorthand by Ronald Reagan, the state isn't the problem, the state is, uh, sorry, the state isn't this, the antipode and Reagan, this is all upside down. The state is not the solution, the state is the problem. Uh, of course, Hayek is a very sophisticated writer and uh, that doesn't in any way sum up what he's saying. But a kind of ingrained, fundamental suspicion, scepticism of what the state can do is fundamental also to him. There are certain things that it should do. But there are certain things no one who exercises large-scale power is in a position to do, and therefore it's folly for them to do. This is the wholesale critique. There is a moral and conceptual fault, according to Hayek, in thinking that the state can be used and its laws be vehicles for the generation of what he says somewhat derisorily is called social justice. Justice is not a word that can be attributed, can be annexed to so society, nor annexed to the results of activities. Justice is a qualifier of individuals and individual actions. What follows from them in aggregate terms is something that is simply a category mistake to say that we can qualify this, we can call this just. It's just a term doesn't apply there. And to apply it is not simply a category mistake, but it's a malevolent one because it authorises states to do what they can't do, and they can't do it for epistemological reasons. No individual or group of individuals can bring together and make sense 
of the sort of information which markets simply by the millions of inputs which automatically, spontaneously, as he puts it, goes into them, generally does. And so, harnessed to a conceptual error, that justice is something, a word we can apply to society, a moral error, which believes that it's the justice calculated in aggregate, which we are talking about and should be engineering societies and states to produce, not only are there those faults in conception and, and aim, but where the people who are victims of those faults are doing what's impossible for any individuals or groups to do. And that's the wholesale critique. The retail critique is, and this has a pathologizing effect on the character, the fundamentally important character of law in a good society or in a free society. Law, Hayek is not like uh, some of his more simplistic acolytes. He's not hostile to the state in itself. States are necessary and certain state and functions have to be performed for a well-functioning market order to be possible. In particular, states have to be, they have to set up and they have to enforce constitutive rules of the game. Without those, everything runs amok. They have to be policed and they're policed uh, by, on the basis of laws which need to be general, which need to be clear, which need to be prospective. It's not exactly uh, Fuller's list, but it's in the same ballpark. Those laws run the risk, which he thinks is a risk that has been run, of being polluted, corroded, uh, made indistinguishable from ordinary, uh, arbitrary discretions increasingly loaded onto administrators by open-ended legislation uh, in the pursuit of the mirage of social justice, as he calls the second volume of his three-volume law, Legislation and Liberty. And so this is a, the first is a, a critique at the level of ultimate values and ultimate ambitions to reach those values. The second is an instrumental critique. If you do that, law is going to be corrupted in a fundamental way. It's not going to be able to do what is fundamentally important for law to do in a society. Uh, he was writing this in the 70s when, if, you, if you're old enough, uh, you'll recall many other people were talking about crises in, the, in, in modern law, the substantialization, materialization of law. My PhD supervisor used to sing this song very often and with very little amendment about the, um, uh, the corruption of a Gesellschaft law, the law of a society of individuals, by Gemeinschaft law, the law of a community, aided by bureaucratic administrative regulation. Roberto Unger, though he had a different political to the moral take on it, also in the 70s said this was happening. So Hayek was not alone, but that was a period where there was an enormous amount of t crisis talk going on among some academic lawyers. And the crisis was something which neoliberals felt to be a fundamental crisis because they were so attached, if they thought about law at all, as Hayek certainly did, to a conception that law has few but fundamentally important things to do. It has to set up the frame and it has to uh, police the clear rules. And then later neoliberals increasingly said, and the, not just any rules, the rules that you really have to focus on are contract, property, and crime. These are the key things that need to be kept in a rigorously clear, predictable, and in some ways unalterable fashion. Uh, one more thing to say about that, which I haven't said so far, but is very important in a distinction between Hayek and the people who have claimed to follow him, at least in his later and more influential writings, Hayek, and at least till he moved to Anglo-Saxon countries from Europe, which was a long time ago, Hayek's model for law was the common law. It began 
who was a sort of an extract model that was about, from his time in, in America and Britain, he said the common law, it's the genius of the common law to change without a changer. It's not his expression, but what he was saying is that course law changes, but the common law has rigged it that it changes spontaneously and not at the behest of any change maker. He uh, distinguishes between two conceptions, nomos and thesis, and the, the thesis, the, the first is to come, uh, Michael Oakeshaw's, these things change, but they change in their own ways. They aren't planned, they aren't legislated, they change by accretion over time and spontaneously as society changes. That is a matter for Hayek of fundamental importance, and I'll come back to it in a second. Now, it seems to me that uh, both at the, oh, sorry, Hayek was mainly talking about the societies in which he lived uh, or societies like them. So he was talking primarily about um, countries of the West, of Europe. Uh, his, his first political book, The Road to Serfdom, was inspired both by uh, communism, not inspired by communism, anti-inspired by communism and Nazism. So the road to serfdom, serfdom as exemplified in communist and Nazi states was a road which was, to, it's worth rereading because the, it, it's, the argument was that all the intellectual moves that were the foundation of communism and Nazism were available in social democratic uh, rhetoric of the Webbs and others in uh, the West. And the moves were moves to replace uh, the spontaneous working of Marxists with these jerk knowles who, sorry, not his, not his term, but I just thought of it, uh, who thought they could do better. That's all it took for one to be on this slope, this road to serfdom. Uh, later, neoliberals, I think first in Chile, uh, when they, a number of advisors from, from uh, Chicago, students then not of Hayek but mainly of Milton Friedman, went to Chile and then in a proliferation after the collapse of communism, uh, the neoliberal uh, views of these things were propagated in countries unlike the ones which Hayek wrote about, but in countries which were judged to be deficient in the rule of law and to need help by rule of law experts. Uh, and so, I don't know if you know the Australian serial Home and Away, so first Hayek was talking about home, and then they moved away, and I'll uh, break up my last remarks, first home and then away. First of all, in home, uh, Hayek's road to serfdom, even though there's been plenty of opportunity for it, has never been taken by anyone. There have been lots of despotisms around the world, and none of them have come on that route, none, which is not a bad, I think, empirical test after, since the book was published in, in the 1940s. Uh, and partly, it's, there is a kind of rigorous simplicity uh, in Hayek's writings, which, or, or logical clarity, uh, which sometimes can, is a fault, it seems to me. Hayek often sets up dichotomies between a society where everything fits together, which is a free market society, and another one where everything fits together, which is where governments are meddling, producing social, what they call social justice, etc. He said, well, you can't have this, which is an interlocking system, if you've got that, which is another completely hostile interlocking system. And the only difficulty, seems to me, uh, is that we're never here and we're never here. We always mess around. We always muddle through with a bit of this and a bit of that. So for you to say, but this muddling is so extreme that we're really on a road to serfdom, you've got to make some in empirical, institutional, and social assessment, which he never does, because he stays at this level of abstraction. Again, to say that the state is not the solution, but it's the problem, is a problem even with Hayek, because, as I've said, for him the state is fundamental, and the laws are fun that are produced by the state, you can't have a market society without it. Okay, so the next step in defence is to say, oh, look, you can have rights, 
uh, guaranteed by the state, which don't require the states to do anything. They just have to be enforced, like what used to be called negative liberties, uh, civil and political rights. All right, somebody uh, beats you up, the courts operate. What you can't have on this view, as uh, generated by state is social and economic transformation, social and economic rights. And this purported gulf between what is kosher in neoliberal terms or what is not is a very important, was a very important pa part of human rights discussion in the 70s and 80s that you could, human rights need to be civil and political rights if they go to be social and economic rights, you've jumped a divide, which suddenly involved the state in doing all of this grandiose stuff which you can't afford and doesn't know what to do. Seems to me, and again, this is Stephen Holmes and, and to some extent, um, God, I've forgotten his name, whoever it was who wrote with Holmes, the book, The Cost of Rights, seems to me have exploded this distinction, at least as a dichotomy. Holmes uh, points out it costs a lot to have a good court system. It costs a lot to enforce civil and political rights. It costs a lot, you're spending a lot, and often, and Holmes in writing, who has written a lot about Russia, post-communist Russia, has pointed out, we thought as liberals that we learned that the lesson to be learned was co from communism was uh, that an over-powerful over state is a terrible thing. We learned from post-communism, he was thinking of the Yeltsin period, that an inadequate state is a terrible thing. On the retail, and now I'm going to, even though this is half the paper and the pay, it's the scheduled part of the paper, as always, I've said too much at the beginning, so I'll, I'll speed up with the end. But I think I can, because they're easy points to make. Uh, I'm still at home, but the home, on the critique of law, again, Hayek says, look, if you've got law which is, sets, the, uh, sets the rules and forces the rules, it's very different from strategic advice to players. Sure. If, that's the, if these are the options, and if anyone lives in this world or that world, but no one lives in that world. We live in a messy world where we, certain laws really are fundamental that we know what we're going to be accused of, and we know how to deal with that. And erosion of those, not in a single step, but over a complicated range of, of transformations, can be, as it was in Germany, a terrible, terrible thing. But again, it's not a dichotomy which it's often presented to be. And particularly not because uh, not every society faces the same dangers. Some societies are very strong in their sense of the, and the stability of the law. Now let me move quickly to Array, uh, to Away, which is actually the focus of most of my attention generally, that is rule of law promotion programs. These haven't been taken over, but they have been enormously influenced by uh, neoliberal prescriptions. When I started being interested in, in 89 and 90, the rhetoric, because none of the economists were dissidents and none of the dissidents were economists. The economists never were. There's not one economist I can think of since 68, Otashik in, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, who was an economist. But they all became, Václav Klaus, the great uh, neoliberal uh, in Czech Czechoslovakia, was nowhere to be seen uh, among dissidents before it became safe to do so. And the dissidents, none of them were economists. And they weren't thinking economics, particularly since they never thought that power was available to them, that they were going to get anywhere near it. They wanted to civilize these despotisms they lived within. Suddenly, the world changed, and the originating rhetoric was still political. It was despotism, it was constraint, it was constitutions, it was constitutional courts. But very quickly, uh, a takeover, not a takeover, but anyway, another development influenced, uh, and sorry, and one other thing is another agenda, quite apart from post-communism, was post-conflict interventions from the UN and other things that Simon knows a lot more than I know about. These weren't all economic either, nor are they still. But the neoliberal agenda meshed in some respects with the dissident agenda. They were hostile, at least in ex-communist states, they were hostile to the state. And many of them found it plausible that the state was their enemy. And uh, neoliberals have had enormous influence in these away ventures. And their focus has been, as lawyers' focus generally is, on central institutions of law. Focus has been on the quality, on 
institution, on legal institutions, courts, and so on and so forth, but also on substantive areas of law, such as property, contract, and crime, as I mentioned. Uh, and an enormous amount of money has been packed into it. And people who find, as many people have found, that for the money that has been spent, rule of law has not sprung up in any fashion that might be identified by people who started with the disposition I started with, often now attack the rule of law for this. And I want to bleat, but it's not been tried. People are doing something else. It's the, only the words have moved, but uh, it's not got much to do with the originating ideal, which seems to me still un, uh, untarnished by the failure of certain, sometimes misguided efforts uh, to, to uh, make the rule of law a brand for activities, which may or may not be serving it. And let me mention, to conclude, uh, a few reasons that I'm skeptical about it. First of all, I mentioned that uh, Hayek was hostile to, he saw the, the uh, proper attitude to law and society as being one of cultivation, a metaphor he used, rather than rationalist planning. He wanted, he believed that the only way consistent with the genius of the market and the non-genius of us uh, was uh, spontaneous transformation. This would, if it was ever acknowledged, should come as an extraordinary surprise to people who claim to be his followers, none of whom are interested much in cultivating. They see everything that when they go to Burma or wherever it is, it's all weeds, all the weeds have to be got rid of, and some new, rarely do we talk in agricultural metaphors about what we're bringing in. We're building the rule of law. We're not putting some water and a bit of manure. Well, there is a bit of manure. Uh, that notion that this program, this conception, which is a conception, a social theory and an economic and political theory, can be taken over by social engineers, I think would be anathema to, to Hayek. All right, that may not be such a bad thing. But Hayek was onto something, which uh, I pursue in the paper uh, for Thursday and, and in a lot of other stuff I've written. Legal engineers don't have a clue yet about what goes in to securing the values of the rule of law. Uh, they take a punt, which they take to be an assurance, that it's got something to do with their box of tricks. And I think a test of this assurance is the failure of so many rule of law projects around the world. Context does matter. Contexts are complicated and they vary. Hayek was right about that, but that is not much solace to his followers. Thirdly, to the extent that we think of the rule of law promotion business in neoliberal terms, there is a possibility, highly plausible, and uh, there is evidence of it, it doesn't have to be the case, but there's a lot of evidence, that rule of law initiatives will be systematically biased towards some sectors of a society and against others. That is, if your rule of law agenda is primarily thought of as the thing to foster trade and investment, then there are only certain sorts of law and certain sorts of people who are likely to be your first primary targets for the rule of law business. And often, uh, that can go in hand with an ignorance of or a slighting of the interests of uh, people who aren't likely to be prominent in the investment and trade business. But if we go back to the originating Aristotelian insight or the common law interest, it wasn't just about or even about trade and investment. It was about the harmful effects of arbitrary exercise of power. And I ask, a question I ask myself is, I remember being at a Global Development Network conference where I was hit and back to then I thought, well, this is good news. No, I don't where a Nobel Prize winning economist, this was around the time Clinton was in power, famous for having said it's the economy stupid. So at this GDN uh, gathering, the economist says, meaning to be provocative, it's not the economy stupid, it's the law stupid. By which he meant it's the law because the economy is so important. So we need the law for the economy. That 
might have the result that I've just mentioned, that is a skewing towards some sectors and not others. But even apart from that, what I've asked myself recently is, but what if you're wrong about that? What if you found out that even in my sense, the, t the tempering of power, so it's not arbitrary, doesn't get you uh, the economic, the eco economy is or what if you find that the, co the causal, the social causal networks you hypothesize are not as persuasively uh, connected as you thought? And there is plenty of debate about that. The economists, not economists, but people who've talked about this in the rule of law development uh, business, sometimes identify two sorts of problems. One is they call the revo reverse causality problem. It's the case that uh, there is in economically well, highly developed societies, it is often the case that legal institutions are pretty well developed too. The reverse causality question asks, which came first? Is it, or which has priority in a causal sense? Could it be the case that economic development generates legal development rather than the other way around? It's likely to be neither or both or whatever, but still, that is one not yet resolved issue. You start with some plausible hypothesis. If the joint is rocking too much, you don't know what's happening, you keep your head down. Stalin point, uh, he didn't point it out actually, but he exemplified it. Uh, but to transform that into institutional specifics is not based on the st strongest, uh, strong ground that, is, that it is often thought to be based on, or at least it's arguable. Secondly, there is what they call, and I'm sorry about the word, but it's not mine, the endogeneity problem. So again, you can say, look, you find uh, societies where a lot of things seem to be going in the right direction, and the law is too, uh, but it's not just that you don't know which of these things caused the other things. It might be that some other things caused all these things. Uh, sorry, that's not pellucid in formulation. Let me just give an example, which I was at a, work, a workshop in, in Amsterdam a few months ago, where an empirical uh, political scientist, Mila Festig, who does a lot of stuff on constitutional, testing constitutions, how they work and what changes have changes socially. Here she did a particular, I thought a fascinating experiment or investigation. She looked at three of the most influential index builders. Uh, so I was talking with somebody earlier about the rule of law, uh, the World Justice Project's rule of law index, which I understand is now being brought to Singapore as it has been to many places. That's the most comprehensive of these indices, but there are plenty of others. And she compared the World Justice Project Index with the um, Heritage Foundation's Index and the Liberty Fund Index. And I'm about to finish. Three minutes, five minutes? But, but I will stop, I'm sorry. Um, but we did start there. Uh, I just to leave sometime. Sure, no, 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 you're right, you're right, I'm wrong and I always do it. Um, she found that, so they're different indices. Uh, world justice is, is the most comprehensive, the heritage is most interested in economic rights, uh, the Liberty Fund is interested particularly in civil and political rights. They all uh, focus, was her argument, on different elements of legal orders. It's the prime focus. That's the first one, but they all call it the rule of law. But the second point is they correlate very highly. Uh, all of them. So if you're high on a World Justice Project Index, you're high on Heritage, you're high on Liberty Fund. And she said, she was speculating, she doesn't know, and she said something which I thought was ambiguous in an interesting way. She said, I don't know if there's something underlying this which no one is looking at, which might uh, explain all these things. Some other feature, or maybe it's just legal orders. There's some uh, legal orders are a package and they may have picked different parts of the package, but the package is a package. But there's a second interpretation, which might be that something other than all this, which is not part of the legal order, generates, goes with a more found financial system and various other things. In which case, because these indices are not just analytic devices, they're programmatic devices,
the consequence, the practical consequence of a low finding in an index should be, well, we'll put more into the institutions which have low findings so they more resemble the ones that have high findings. But if the, pro if the, the causes are out here, they're not part of the package, that might be misguided. And finally, and for me normatively most important, what if uh, you found no economic benefit whatsoever from reducing the arbitrariness of law? Does that mean you've backed the wrong horse, get out of the rule of law business? It might mean that if economics is your only interest. But if you started with a moral political uh, disposition I began with, that there is something truly noxious and obnoxious about arbitrary exercise of substantial power, whether it be by the state or whether by other factors, then you have no reason to shift your horse to other courses. The, the, the uh, tempering of power so that it not be arbitrary is not an external result you hope for from the law, rule of law. It'll do something for the economy. It might do something for something else. But that's the only way we talk in the international business now. It's an imminent value which has to do with certain moral purposes which might be achieved. And if it is the case that the rule of law is good for the economy, I'm very happy. But that's a second question, and people seem to me to have lost and forgotten the first question. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, uh, I think we're going to take questions in a moment.